in South Africa. And then we're also lucky to be joined by two gentlemen from UK wine merchant uh, Robeson, um, Alex Hurley and Keith Kirkpatrick. I'll introduce them properly in a second. So um, yeah, everybody that bought the packs and are joining us, thanks so much. Thanks for everybody that registered. Um, everybody on YouTube Live, we're really excited to have you join us and um, just start the conversation on California wines and um, yeah, taste with us. Please let us know what's in your glass. Um, if it's some of the four wines that we're tasting tonight or you're tasting some in between, um, yeah, just, just tell us in the chats. We're really excited to hear and to learn, just talk about it. We're looking to have the tasting for about 45 minutes to an hour. And um, yeah, please engage, ask us questions. We'll try to answer during or afterward. Um, yeah, Alex is the in-house winemaker there, so he can answer any questions, viticulturally, onologically, stylistically. And then Keith, um, he is their head buyer, so he travels all over. He knows California probably better than Americans, so we're very excited to have them. There'll be some polls as well going on, so um, yeah, get on those. And then also some questions that you can choose to answer, um, ask the panelists or panelists and attendees um, all together. So yeah, last week we did a we did an offer on some of the classical elegant new waves, um, Sandy and Kutch. We're tasting Sandy Chardonnay today from Santa Barbara County, the 2016. Um, I have that in my glass. I'm going to start looking what other people have if it's not that. And um, yeah, so basically UK wine, um, UK wine merchant. Robeson, um, they were quite instrumental in bringing California wines to the UK, as I understand, and also spearheading the new wave movement and getting that to consumers there. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Keith, who'll just tell us a bit about Robeson, um, their philosophy, their history, and also just give us a quick background um, on Californian wine in general, and then we'll start with the map and the tasting. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm the, the buyer at Roberson. I've um, been there for uh, just over 10 years. Uh, Roberson Wine started off in 1991 as a retailer with a high street shop. Um, over the years, it has then grown to become a distributor to sort of all the top restaurants um, and other retailers in London. Um, originally, uh, very much a specialist in European wines, very much focused on classic French styles, um, plus Italy, Spain, Germany, uh, the usual classic European regions. Um, and then in around about 2013, um, we started getting some interest from some clients who were kind of like collectors, uh, sort of investors, fine wine clients who were asking a couple of questions about Californian wines, a couple of new producers in particular who were getting a good critical acclaim. Um, and this kind of coincided as well with um, a period in the restaurant market where we saw an interest coming from sommeliers and some, some of these kind of like new producers that were coming through. So we were um, introduced initially to our, our very first contact in California was uh, Jamie Kutch, um, who's, uh, you know, whose wine you have. So we got in touch with Jamie, um, had a discussion about this kind of like new style, um, new style of wine that was being made in California, where there was much more emphasis on kind of like elegance, um, a nice blend of savory fruit, freshness, good acidity, and much less emphasis on like high extraction, high alcohol, lots of new wood. It was all a very much a, a much more kind of like European uh, philosophy. And that was something we really liked because um, our portfolio, a lot of the wines we work with, they're all based around wines that you can have, that you would want to have with a meal sitting down and you want to like drink a bottle of it. Wines that you don't want to just taste once and say, oh, that's interesting and move on. It's wines that you really want to keep drinking, particularly with a meal. So um, initially we did a, a little bit of wine with Jamie Kutch and we got a really fantastic response to that, particularly from restaurants. We went back to buy some more wine and he basically said to us, OK, if you like my wine, you're going to like this guy's wine and this guy's wine and this guy's wine. So he introduced us to Rajat Par and Sashi Murma. And if any of you know Raj or have ever met him, basically once you've met him, you've met pretty much everybody. Okay. So um, we um, we sort of went to California to see to see Jamie, to see Raj and Sashi. 
and kind of did this bit of a kind of like whirlwind trip around and met a whole bunch of these kind of like small producers who were new on the scene, who were following these new philosophies, um, looking for terroir expression, um, trying to show what California was capable of outside of the two markets that they were best known for. So California always had a very strong uh, market in the UK at the very cheap, very entry level supermarket mass produced wines, which to us as importers weren't really that interesting. We were much more focused on that kind of mid-level. The other market that was strong for California in the UK was the other end of the scale, like the really super expensive hundreds of dollars, like Icon wines, you know, 100 point Parker stuff. Similarly, we weren't really interested in those because, OK, they're interesting to taste, but you don't really want to drink them. So we we just knew that there must be a lot of people out there in that middle part where it gets really interesting, where um, you've got like um, price points you know above entry level but below the really super expensive stuff small producers producing small small quantities of like sort of experimental wines as well as the classic uh, varieties like chardonnay cabernet pinot sierra so we met um we like we met like a good you know 30 40 different producers and our california portfolio went from like one producer to 30 within the space of a year okay. and 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 that that ranged from really tiny producers right up to some very established famous names like Maya Camus or Kongsgård, that kind of thing. And um, the, the, the point being that all of the wines kind of, uh, the producers were all interesting. All the, they had a story, the wines had a story. Um, they were trying to do something authentic and show, um, to basically show that California has terroir and has possibilities. Mm -hmm. Wines from Northern California don't taste the same as wines from Southern California. You know, wines from uh, like Amador County are very different from wines from Sonoma, um, you know, and it was it was just like a really exciting journey. And, you know, very quickly, we became very well known for our California selection. Uh, we've won the Decanter magazine and the IWC award for California specialist for I think seven years in a row now, both of them. So it was a very exciting journey um, with most regions or wines that you want to bring into the market the place you kind of we started with was restaurants as soon as we got sommeliers on side um to really back the wines then they were hand selling them to their clients so then those restaurant clients are then going to their local wine merchant and saying look i've tried these really exciting new styles of california wines. have you got them if you don't have them can you get them in for me so what started off as very much a trade and restaurant focused project is now very much like we, we sell just as much California wine, if not more, through consumer channel than we do through a restaurant. Wow. So it's um yeah, it, it's it's been very exciting. And the you know the, the producers are all very interesting, very good to work with. Um and like I said, they all follow the same kind of philosophy where they're it, it kind of um some of them are sort of what you might call natural winemakers, but not natural in the European sense, which is like really natural. Um, <laughs> In California, what they would tend to refer to as natural would be, okay, just organic fruit, um, you know, used oak, um, using sulfur sensibly, not, not eliminating it completely, but using it sensibly, mm -hmm. and just not using any you know, like enzy enzymes, additions, adding, ta adding tannin, adding acid, whatever. So just like a more, like quite a kind of um, yeah. low intervention approach. So, and that's what we like. Mm -hmm. So that's a little potted history of California wine and roads. Nice. <laughs> Thanks. And so um, when you look at the map that Paige will put up for you now, when you look at California, um, generally you see, well, if I think about California historically, the Golden State, it feels like it's really hot. But then mm -hmm. obviously when you look, um, because of the Pacific influence, they have what you kind of call um, nature's air conditioning. So the Pacific yeah. breezes come in and there are so many um, hills and mountain areas that um, basically they funnel these, these cool yeah. winds and breezes through the vineyards. And I yeah. know I saw that um, with Sandy when we're in Santa Rita Hills or the Santa Barbara County. And I mean, there the hills obviously they run perpendicular to the ocean. And yeah. I just remember seeing, you know, it was so much colder in kind of that 
little yeah. pocket at Lampo than it was, well, yeah. 50 kilometers the other way. I mean, if you go to Ballard Canyon um, or Los Olivos, that's almost more Rhone country, you know, than yeah. it's Sierra and, and, and Brusan. So yeah. um, do you see the UK consumers preferring the, um, the classical varieties, the Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Syrah, or is Zinfandel and Californian Chenin of interest? Um, the sort of Pinot and Chardonnay are still very much king. They, they, they still very much rule, <clears throat> but certainly um, being able to show people a different expression of Zinfandel um, was really interesting and people really got on board with that. Similarly, uh, varieties like Chenin Blanc, um, and then you know you have a lot of varieties, things things like uh, like like Trousseau, um, mm -hmm. sort of Trousseau Gris, yeah. Gamay, Valdiguier. There's all these because in California they're relatively unrestricted on what they can plant where. There, there's mm -hmm. green opportunities for young winemakers to go and just you know get a get a get a couple of tons of Trousseau Gris and make something really exciting. Um, and just you know like you were saying, talking about the climate. Um, you know, specifically in that Santa Rita Hills area, you know, everyone would, would assume that because you're just north of LA, that it's going to be hot, you know, and, and like really trying to explain to people that know if you go away north up into Sonoma and Napa, it's much hotter than it is in Santa Rita Hills. And it's entirely just due to that ocean influence. So the, 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 big, the big challenge that we had, and it took a number of years, it's, it was all about the education and edu educating people that California wine is not one homogenous style from the whole state. A Pinot, Noir, a Pinot Noir from Santa Rita Hills is completely different one from the Sonoma Coast or Santa Cruz Mountains or whatever. So, and it's been the, the, the cooler climate sites are the wines that have really captivated people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool, thanks. So um, just before we go on further, let me just explain the tasting. So our thinking in this, uh, the full pack, that we made available was to kind of show the coast really quickly in a snapshot in its entirety and with different producers, um, but also make it an affordable pack to buy. So our first wine that we have, I have the bottle here, is from Sandy, so and it's the Santa Barbara County Chardonnay 2016. Mm -hmm. And then again, on your map, you'll see that's on the south. It's the central coast, but it's more on the southern part, so just north of, of, of Santa Barbara. Um, so I did a harvest there in 2012 with Raz and Sashi. And um, so I spoke to them earlier when, when we were lucky enough to, to purchase these wines to offer it to our customers. And um, I asked Sashi about the 2016 vintage. I mean, working there, you know, it was almost like being in, like you're in a winery, but you're also in a philosophy class and a history class and yeah. a cooking class at the same time. So it's... Mm -hmm. um, yeah. very interesting experience and they were saying you know their philosophy was i mean they started sandy to look at um basically the santa rita hills and kind of see which vineyards are really interesting and like you said earlier keith you know the pursuit um well of balance and then looking at tewa and i think for me that's really what the new wave california is is mm -hmm. really capitalizing and searching for those pockets that really reflect the the cultivars in the in the yeah. best way um, and Sasha said on the 2016, um, it was quite a cool growing region, um, quite cool growing time um, period. And so they actually let it hang, the Chardonnay let it hang a bit longer to just make sure it gets the sugar and the fruit. And then they also kept it for longer in barrel. Um, so Alex, you've obviously tasted some of their other vintages. And I mean, this is their, I guess they call it their Macron, like more their um, Regional. Um, is this sandy? It's you know, it's lovely. I found it like quite open, it um, beautifully fruited, very floral, very elegant, uh, decidedly new world. But, um, is this their style? Is it normally more mineral or more austere? For me, it's um, so hi everyone. I'm Alex, I'm the winemaker, and I'm, I'm in the cellar this afternoon to prove it. Um, but look, when I started at Robus and actually um, tasting a couple of these wines that they've been bringing in. It is, this is the sort of new wave that, that everyone's talking about. This is a good um, uh, example, I suppose. The key thing is it has great acidity. Um, so the warmer your climate is, we have the same problem in Australia where I'm originally from. Um, in South Africa, you have the same thing. There's very warm sites. And with Chardonnay, the risk is they can get too ripe, 
um, you lose the acidity and then the balance is really out of whack. Um, you'll also notice if you sip this wine that the oak is really in the background. It's about fruit uh, clarity. It's about, so they're really, really highlighting uh, the region, the terroir. There's nothing hiding. It's really uh, transparent, this wine, in that it, it speaks of its place. Uh, the oak is very mild. It's, uh, it's there, it's present, but it's not, it's not a heavy handed approach. Um, and that is the classic connotation for California and, and Australia back in the day was this heavy hand oak was a style that people liked. And, but it, this, is, this is, I suppose, the, one of the major points of difference in, in the new wave is that their, their hand is a little lighter with these things. So you can see the fruit much more clearly. Um, what do you think, Keith, of this vintage? You're the, uh, you'd know more about uh, comparing to different vintages, but to me it's- Yeah, well, the, the thing to remember uh, with Sandy um, and also Domaine de la Cote, uh, their Pinot Noir label, well, sorry, their, their estate label, um, two, it was only 2011 was their first commercial vintage. So it's only this year that, that they'll have 10 years under their belt. So for a lot of those, for, for they'll tell you themselves as well, for, for pretty much all of the vintages so far, they've, they've been trying to find the sweet spot. You know, they've, they've been changing, changing a little thing each year to try and find where they can get that best expression. Um, you know, uh, they sort of put pulling pulling away back um, on um, on certain things where you get to like a really lean, really mineral style. But if you think that's not the best, then you go back a little bit the other way. So I think it really probably took them five, six vintages to find where they really were with um, with what the vineyards could offer them. And the vineyards are aren't um, you know the, the vineyards the the vines are really only now coming to really express what they're fully capable of. So. Um, Sort of going from 16 to 17, you know, 17, um, the style of 17 compared to 16 um, generally was a, a little bit um, kind of a, a little bit leaner, a little bit um, kind of like less muscle. Um, part of the reason for that was in 17, they had a lot of um, heat spikes, heat waves and coming into, coming into September, sort of. Um, a lot of producers who were very conscious of not going too high on alcohol and losing aromatics, they, they, they picked they picked before the heat came. So, which kind of resulted in some kind of like lighter styles, but which, you know, which I love. Um, but then, you know, the great thing is that um, vintage to vintage, the, the wines are different because they're letting the vintage be expressed in the glass. It's another conception was that um, it's the same as the, in the UK, people had, the, had this idea 20 years ago that every vintage in Australia was exactly the same. It was always perfect. You know, it was always the right temperature. It was always the right amount of rain and every vintage was the same. People kind of had the same idea about California, but um, whenever you have, you know, 15% alcohol and 100% new oak, you can't really detect any of that nuance. Yeah. So it's really only these kind of newer, uh, new wave producers that are making wine that are a bit more stripped back on the wood and on the alcohol and letting the fruit on the vineyard really show, then actually that's when you get to see vintage variation. So 14 was different from 15, was different from 16, was different from 17. Mm -hmm. So, and it's all part of that education process of showing people. Mm -hmm. Where does this wine fit in the, the um, Sandy lineup though? You were explaining- This, this, is, this is kind of their, um, what they would call their Appalachian wine. It's kind of their entry, their entry cuvee. Mm -hmm. So um, they make um, a few single vineyard bottlings and then, which are all Santa Rita Hills AVA. So then this is the Santa Barbara Conti, which is some declassified fruit from the single vineyards plus one extra uh, vineyard source. So they use, the, yeah, they use this kind of like as their introduction to the range. Um, it's kind of like their, you know, their, their price point wine to get new customers into the, into the Sandy experience. And do you find with the New Wave California, I was quite struck by the fact that in Lampoque, they had the, the wine ghetto, where yeah. they you know, very proudly made the wines and a lot of small producers. And that was also kind of in contrast to what you expect from the bigger states, maybe in Napa and so. Yeah. Do you see that all along the coast? Um, is that a sudden thing? Yeah, it's kind of, um, it's growing. If so, if, you, if you're in around um, San Francisco or in Sonoma, especially, um, you'll find a lot of like sort of shared winery facilities. Mm -hmm. There, 
not very romantic buildings, but you kind of like go through, go through a door um, and you'll find, you know, like maybe 15 or as many as 15 or 20 different producers just yeah. with, their, with their own sort of small allocated space. Mm-hmm. They'll have like shared equipment. So they'll have like some big tanks. Um, if you need to use a big tank, they'll like share a forklift and all this kind of stuff, share a press. So these facilities have really enabled um, a lot of young winemakers to kind of get, you know, to, to get on the ladder because they, they can't afford to buy vineyard land. It's just impossible, um, but you can't buy fruit. And if you can find a facility where you can share equipment and just have uh, sort of lower costs, it really helps you get up and running. But um, yeah, so the Lompoc is, is it's kind of a, you know, it's a funny little place. Um, I, I don't know, they, they look like old kind of like, army barracks or something just like yeah. buildings. but we, we, when they when they started there um i think in 2007 whenever they planted the vineyards um they were the only people in the area everyone told them you can't grow pito and chardonnay there it's impossible you know, it's at the very kind of like western tip of the santa rita hills yeah. everyone said look you're crazy you're wasting your time you're wasting money you can't make you, you can't grow good vines there it's too cold it's too windy it's not going to happen and now if you fast forward 10 years later, every piece of land around them has been sold. And it's been, this land has been bought by some of these like mega producers in Napa that have billions mm-hmm. in the bank. So it's all like big iconic name wineries are now coming and buying all the land around Domain de la Cote. Um, because everyone sat back and watched for 10 years and said, okay, they haven't failed. The wines are brilliant. And now, and now they're surrounded by vineyards. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I wanted to check while we're going on to the next wine, which um, if you have it there, it's the Mouvaz Pinot Noir 2016 from Monterey County, which is a bit further north than Santa Rita Hills. Um, these labels, and I'll show the others um, a bit later, is that also a sign? I mean, can you look at an American label and know that it's going to be new wave or a certain style? Um, um, not, not really. Unfortunately, there, there are a lot of brands in California and a lot of them have like very good packaging and they're, you know, like eye catching, but, um, you have to, there's so much bulk wine available in California. There are so many, so many brands on the market. You really have to taste through a lot of fairly average stuff before you find something that is like really going to do it for you. So that's what that's what wine importers are for we taste through all the uh uninteresting <laughs> stuff to find you the good ones so um so yeah there's something like moo buzz it's a it's a different um different proposition to a wine like sandy okay which is a you know two people small operation making sort of small volumes of really nice boutique wines mm-hmm. moo buzz it is a brand it's a brand owned by uh sebastiani family who have been um, Italian family that have been in the California wine industry for over a hundred years and they they own many different brands within their family but what is really interesting about the, this brand Mubaz is that they were deliberately trying to produce um, a Pinot Noir and a Chardonnay that would appeal to a sommelier or to a restaurant diner okay. so it, it's, it's very purposefully made so it's not over extracted, it's not overly oaked. Um, it's a it's a balance of bright red fruit, some savory notes. Mm-hmm. And like I said before, you kind of you have one glass and you want to go back for another. Um, so yes, it is a little bit more expensive than the very entry brands, but it's at a nice tipping point where you can most people can afford to drink a bottle of it, and it's just very pleasurable. And it's made to be made to be kind of not in entirely in the new wave style, but kind of like hinting towards that, you know, less extraction, brighter fruit, some acid, yeah. and just make it just make it like really smashable, you know. Yeah. What I love, it has the sort of a hint of earthiness or mushroom at the end, which uh, I think without that, it wouldn't feel very complex yeah. or it is a lot of red fruits and bright red fruits for me. But because of that little twist of savory at the end, it, it's amazing for food pairing. Mm. It's the you know it's the it's the value end of the Californian Pinot range, mm. so it has that complexity which which gives it the interest I think. Yeah. yeah. And it's so interesting. We um, earlier this afternoon when I opened the wines and we tasted at work all together, 
this wine we were like mm. it's like a almost like a twizzy like southern rome wine but when yeah. you said now you know it's i mean those wines are complete food wines yeah. um you know you get some yeah some like beautiful red fruit um beautiful tannin you know some apricot almost some orange and dry but it just it goes so well with food and this was our immediate thought and then when i looked at the tasting notes it also did say that they um blended with a little bit of of syrah and petit syrah and tannat mm -hmm. and um yeah i think it's just a lovely little wine and like you said you most likely will drink more of that yeah yeah so. yeah it's, it's one of those wines that you um you know, you open it with the intention of having a glass while you're cooking and then finish the rest of dinner. But by the time you've finished cooking, you've drank the whole bowl, you know, so, yeah. long. so you just keep going back for more. So it, the, the, these are wines that we, when we started importing from California, we knew we couldn't just import everything that's kind of like niche boutique, you know, mid range to expensive. We had to do that, that do the ground work, you know, put in the hard work to find some house wines, if you like. So the, so the Mubuz wines we brought in to sell kind of as a proposition for restaurant house wines from California, because yeah. they, they may be a couple of pounds more expensive than other things in the market, but there's just so much better, so much more authentic, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because there, there's no point in us trying to um, take on uh, Bourgogne Rouge with a really commercial California Pinot. It, yeah. it, from California, it has to have uh, it can't be just like straight up sweet fruited commercial juice. There had there had to be some authentic Pinot character, some yeah. of that some of that savory note, so that so that you really could say to someone, okay, Bourgogne Rouge, Mubaz Pinot, you know, they're they're yeah. they're they're both, they're both in the same kind of ballpark. Yeah. And would it be fair to say, um, for me, Californian red wines, it always has this beautiful fruit that I kind of that is what shows it as American to me. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, this is quite lifted and well, in the other reds as well, it's almost like more uh, like plummy, like purple and blue fruit, which in South Africa, we're generally on the red and black spectrum um, yeah. with spice and so. Do you find that in the Californian wines in general? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, I think the great thing they have is lots of sunshine, okay? Mm -hmm. And the problem they've had over the years is trying to um just kind of limit how long you're leaving the fruit in the sunshine you know so and i think going back to cooler climate areas uh, whether that's up high on the sonoma coast or you know above the fog line so where it's it's cool if you're above the fog line it's cool but you get so much sunlight you can get you can get like really fully you know fully ripe flavors in the wine without going crazy on the alcohol and you still retain acidity so yeah, I do, I do think, um, particularly in Donner and Santa Barbara in Southern California, you can really identify that region by, um, by that, by the, the, there's a very pure um, kind of like red and purple fruit character comes through in a lot of the Pinots in particular. And I think you can really identify it. Northern California in Sonoma, you get more, uh, some more savory character. Mm -hmm. uh, Santa Cruz Mountains, you get much more kind of like structure, earthy forest floor. So, um, yeah, the, the, the wines are all different and they, yeah, they've, they've got as much sunshine as they could possibly need. It's just yeah. like keep it, keeping it in check, you know. Yeah. I mean, no, and, as, um, as a winemaker, uh, you typically would pick uh, based on sugar levels. And in the, in the US, if you think of the leaves as solar panels uh, that are loading up the, the sugars into the berries, uh, if you have a lot of sun, they'll, they'll be loading up the berries very quickly. Uh, which can be a problem. So I think Keith mentioned it. There are sites where you can have elevation, which will have cooler nights, which slow this process down and mm -hmm. keep the acidity and the balance in check. You have to find cooler regions like we've talked about now. Uh, so up in the hills or uh, we have the Pacific Ocean cooling effect. So you really have to look for the spots that um, don't just let the berries charge up super fast. You, you don't want that. It's actually against the nature of the fruit, you actually want to load up your berries slowly. So when you mentioned earlier that the 16 Chardonnay was a cool year, mm. I love to hear that. I love cold years. If you can get the fruit off really clean on a cold year, they've had a longer period uh, on the vine, a uh, slow charge rate. And for me, that means it's great in warm regions because you retain acidity. 
uh, and you didn't have to pick them because they're getting too much sugar. So they've had a bit more of a chance to um, express their, their flavors and the grapes actually start to taste, uh, taste interesting. It would be the same with an apple or a peach. If you picked it too early, you don't get the, the, the character of the fruit. Grapes are the same, it's the same analogy. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's my tangent. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, and I saw one of the uh, attendees earlier. They asked about the uh, about smoke taint. Um, I know in yeah. South Africa we've had a lot of or some fires in recent years. I remember 2015 was quite horrific, and we did have quite smoke taint. Um, is yeah. that a problem in California, or uh, something they have to deal with there often? Um, yeah, they've, they've had they've had kind of like a run of vintages where there's been terrible. Uh, wildfire problems um, and some areas followed by floods and landslides, you know, from like rain falling on all the burnt uh, burnt landscapes. But um, 2017 in particular was very bad. Um, in, um, in Napa and Sonoma, particularly badly hit, uh, there's a number of producers that just aren't releasing 2017 wines. Um, because of smoke tint, smoke damage. Um, if the, people don't know what that means, it, it's the smoke, even if the berries under ripe and green and hard, early on in the vintage, if they get hit by smoke, the, the flavors then uh, enter through fermentation, they become apparent. You can't really taste them in the berry, but fermentation unleashes them. Yeah. If they're in, there's no known way really that I know of that mm -hmm. Out. There's a lot of research at the moment to, to try and deal with this because of what's happened in Australia and California in the last yeah. three or four years. It's, it's really sad to hear this story uh, because it, it can affect such a large wide area from even a small fire can and have a lot of uh, heavy smoke. Yeah. yeah. A large region. Yeah, there, there's been um, in 2017 in Northern California, there's yeah a lot of people just will not be releasing um, releasing wines. At the at a time, the, the the really bad heat and fires came at a time that particularly affected producers who harvest were had harvested later, so they still had their fer their ferments active. Um, so a lot of those producers in Northern California that are making kind of those like higher alcohol, really super ripe, big fruited styles, they were in trouble because they had their reds fermenting. Wine still, yeah, no. um, even some fruit still hanging. Producers who prefer to like pick a little bit earlier, like more elegant, lighter styles, fresher acidity, you know, for example, Damien de la Cote or Jamie Cutch or people like that, they had their fruit in and their ferments done whenever the, fi whenever the fires get really bad. So um, it's a lot of those kind of like big iconic Napa producers will suffer a lot in seven for the 17 release. Yeah. And that was another reason why it was so interesting for us that we wanted to share this tasting or do it with people because um you know from a new world point of view it's important to us and there are many similarities like the wildfires in australia in south africa in california and um that's not always apparent in in france or, mm -hmm. or england no. um where they make wine no we don't get it <laughs> <laughs> we have too much rain here that's the opposite yeah, yeah. The, rain, the rain keeps putting out the fires yeah <laughs> we have to yeah Put fires in the vineyards to keep the frost away. We yeah, exactly. We do the opposite here. Exactly the yeah. opposite. Okay, so just moving along, so we don't run out of time. Um, mm. The next wine for you, have the wine, is the Slingshot Cabernet Sauvignon from mm -hmm. the North Coast. Yeah. Um, and that is from a 20, this is 2017 vintage that we have here. Yeah. And um, so I see it's the second level from the Stewart family. Yeah. Uh, they and they own the Juliana Vineyard. So that's um, that's kind of Napa royalty, mm -hmm. more classics, classic style. Yeah. And in this, did they? Do you know if they? Um, I don't know the Juliana Vineyard so well. Did they? Did they change the style with this, or just make it in the same way with different vineyards, kind of to have a, a value offering, as you mentioned earlier? They, they they make the wine a little differently, um, so um, yeah, the sort of Stuart Sellers, they're you know sort of big producer in Napa, like you say, kind of like Napa royalty, um, <clears throat> and they produced this first produced this label, you know, maybe fifteen years ago, 
Mm -hmm. um, and it was targeted very much as a Napa style wine at a very mm -hmm. kind of achievable price point. Mm -hmm. um, Napa has always had this reputation of being like super expensive and only for the elite and for the people who can afford hundreds of dollars a bottle. So James Stewart um, sort of came up with this with this brand um, and it's like majority fruit from Napa from their own vineyards mm -hmm. and then a small uh, amount of purchased fruit from outside the Napa AVA but it's, it's predominantly Napa um, and it yeah I, I think this is a great wine because it has really authentic California style but at the same time has really authentic mm -hmm. um, savory Cabernet Sauvignon notes, um, characteristics that we'd really expect from a Cabernet Sauvignon. But th there's just enough sunshine and fruit to hint at it being from California. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but the fruit is not masked by lots of new oak and high alcohol. Mm -hmm. You can tell you can tell it's a Cabernet Sauvignon, you know. Mm -hmm. So this wine, there um the, someone posted a question. It's 90% cab, 8% petite verdot, and 2% petite Syrah. Hmm. It spent 22 months in oak, which is quite a long time, but only a third of that was new. So yeah. uh, for Cab, that's quite low. Like you, there are Bordeaux producers and California producers that do 100% new. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Means that only one third of the barrels are new, one third are one year old and one third are two years old. So each time you use them, they have less impact. So I think this wine actually has a really nice hit of oak. It had, you, Californian reds can take oak. And this is really elegantly done. I think it's um, it's it's there. It's present in the in the back, but it's not the first thing that you you hit. And that for me is the the, the sort of test that I, I sort of apply. If I can enjoy the fruits first, and then you, you sort of start to get the complexity from the oak and the tannins, even the grippiness, uh, mostly the uh, you know those oak characters, the charred characters, which yeah. add uh, such a nice depth to a, a big red. Yeah. yeah, make that savory element really uh, sort of kick and make it a food pairing wine rather than just just fruit in in Californian reds is just too too much reds and berries and simple and and it's sort of one dimensional. So having that oak is important, but what they've done here is um, yeah kept the balance in check. Yeah, yeah. The, the, this wine was created um, originally for. Even very, very much at the uh, retail market in the US, because James Stewart he wanted to to have a brand that of a Napa Cabernet style that didn't scare people off with the price point. So it had like a really nice um, shelf price in shops in the US. And the thing with the design on the bottle, it, it was like very careful with making that little mark that looks like a hole yeah. in the hole in the label, and that was done specifically because when you see that on a shelf. You want to um, you want to pick it up and touch it because you think there's a hole in the label. So it was all about this, like get, getting people to lift it off the shelf and look at it and think, oh, this looks cool, and give it a go. Okay. So. Yeah. <laughs> and um, earlier, before the tasting started, we we're just talking about pricing of wine. So this that would be about twenty pounds in the UK. The slingshot cap, roughly. Yeah. And um, so we said earlier, from what I remember, my time in America is that. Um, you know, in South Africa, obviously, depending on the vineyard, say if we spend 10 or 20,000 rand per ton of grapes, um, Raj explained to me that in America, California, Santa Barbara County, they would spend 10 or 20,000 dollars on grapes uh, mm. per ton. So immediately that makes it an expensive thing. And you mentioned earlier, is land also quite expensive there? Um, land is expensive um, to the point where pretty much nobody can buy it unless you're like an ex-financier or whatever that just wants to like dabble in the wine game. Yeah. So like almost everyone that's coming through in the last 10 years or whatever, you know, they're, they're purchasing fruit. So on one hand, purchasing fruit is good because um, it means you can make wine without owning land. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the flip side, you don't necessarily have as much control as you would like on what happens in the vineyard um, how the vines are grown and treated. So what you can do, is then you can like with your farming contract you can insist on it and say i want my block to be farmed organically i want you to i want you to train it this way i want you to do this with a canopy i want you to pick on this date and the, and the more requests you put in to the vineyard owner to the farming team 
the price just goes up and up and up and up and up and up and up. Okay. It's not it's not like a, a one price fits all. Yeah. There, there's a price if you want to just turn up with your truck and take some fruit away. But if you want it done the way you want it done, you have to pay for it. And so, just to put it into perspective for people that they can understand from a bottle point of view, because talking about 15 grand a, a ton doesn't mean much because you guys don't buy tons of fruit. Uh, you buy bottles of wine. That, that almost equates to at least 15 US dollars at best, best efficiency before you even have touched the fruit. Uh, $15 in the wine in the bottle. So just in fruit price. So that's before the bottle, the cork, the labor, the fermentation, the filtration, all those steps that keep going that add uh, to the process and add to the costs. Mm. So it becomes quite apparent. The same thing in Burgundy, you can pay 16,000 euros for a ton of fruit from Premier Cru and crazy amounts for Grand Cru. It, 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 it enters the bottle immediately. So the bottle price at, at the starting point in the US for 15,000 a ton, uh, it has to be more than the fruit price, of course, and, yeah. and then all the other on costs. So yeah, it, it explains it. In the UK, to give perspective, we, we're much lower than that. It's about 3,000 pounds a ton, 2,000 pounds a ton. Uh, in Australia, you can get down to 200 to 300 dollars, Australian dollars a ton in the bulk region. Yeah. It's super variable. And as Keith said, if, if you're buying a $400 a ton um vineyard fruit that's all mechanical there's no uh say in what how to farm it it it's yeah. on the back of a truck literally uh mm -hmm. tips into the into a big blender there's no um hands have touched that fruit in its whole life probably mm -hmm. so in california that's not how things are done for um for a lot of the producers we're talking about tonight yeah so that's why you're paying you, you yeah. don't pay for for that sort of side of things yeah and also if you compare it to europe i'm sure in south africa you probably a lot of people will see wines coming from whether it's the loire valley or from the rhone or from Languedoc, and say look this looks like so much more value than these wines from california you know the the, the european wine market just to use france as an example is so much more mature so we work with a lot of producers in france most of them, their land has been in their family for multiple generations. So they, they don't owe a penny on the land. Everything was paid for generations ago. So they, they can work the land, make the wine, and the price they put on the bottle in some ways is just kind of like a nominal what they think their wine is worth, not what it actually really cost them to make it, yeah. you know, because they, they've owned that land and owned those vineyards for generations. So like a massive part of the cost just does not exist. Mm -hmm with most European producers. And New World, or it, I mean, the classic example is in the UK, New New, uh, new Old World, we have where everyone's investing in wineries now. So to do that, you take a big loan from the bank and you have repayments to make. So these are things that in, in France and Spain, obviously people do have that uh, as well, but there's a lot of producers that don't. They're, they're, they're in the clear, they don't owe uh, the bank a repayment every month. So you then factor those costs into your wine price. So newer wineries, newer wine regions, uh, where there's a lot of construction, a lot of new wineries being built. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something to consider that uh, you're, you're also <laughs> paying for the construction of the winery and such. But, you know, in France, that winery was built 400 years ago and uh, yeah. you press in the last five years, that's it. So yeah. Yeah. it's a bit of a different, different world. Yeah. Cool. And just before the final chat, we'll move on to the Cunin Syrah, uh, mm -hmm. Santa Barbara County 2016. So we basically started south, went up north, and we're coming back for the last one. Um, and just this a question about, sorry? Sorry, I was just about to just say this is a, a real personal favorite. I love this wine. Oh, yeah. Mm. Do you, have you visited them? I haven't. I'd love to. Um, it's on the cards, but you know, not not this year, maybe. They have a they have an amazing uh, tasting room to visit in Santa Barbara. Yeah, it's like one block, you know, like maybe hundred meters from the beach. So oh. uh, you can go for a, go for a coffee, walk along the beach, and then walk up this little street. There's kind of like surf shops, skate shops, and then tasting room. So it's a really sweet place to visit. What am I doing in London, Keith? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but for me, it's it's classic New World Syrah. It's the style that I absolutely love. 
up on Syrah, so it's a it's um, a wine that I I passionately love. The grape, you know, yeah. the color is it's not like inky dark, which which tells me they haven't really gone super hard on extraction. So mm -hmm. they've they've when I say that I mean when when you're processing red wine, you can punch it down and. Uh, put water through it to kind of get more of the tannins and the colors out of the skins. You can do that a lot, or you can do that less. It's a winemaker's decision. It's a winemaking philosophy. And in this one, you can feel it in, in, the, in the wine that it's, it's, they're going for an elegant style. They've mm. picked it earlier, so you have great acidity. Um, I think, the, the, oh, sorry. Um, the thing with, uh, with Kunin, um, so Seth Coonan, who started the winery, his history was in like hospitality. He worked in restaurants as a sommelier and stuff, did all that for years and years and years, and then started up a winery and started up these various projects and was very involved with like the sort of sommelier community, trying to educate and mm -hmm. this kind of thing. And he had a real passion for the Rhone and the Loire. So mm -hmm. he um, obviously focused on wines like Syrah and like Chenin Blanc and mm -hmm. uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and was very much, yes, looking for a very sort of classic Rhone or Loire style, looking for elegance. But if you look across the range of wines, I'm not sure what it is on that wine, but on some of the, the alcohols can be quite chunky, you know, um, but he manages to, they, they, they manage to make wines where the alcohol is in balance. It, again, it's because of um, really good choice of vineyard sites, really good choice of like oak regime, winemaking style so you know it is possible to have 14 or 14 and a half for it to be masked by just like like a really like solid character deep wine and interestingly with a syrah um obviously like the 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 big the big argument for the last couple of years between everyone is um do you whole bunch or do you not yeah. um and kunin um they're one winery who have staunchly always said we de-stem always de-stem they were very much of the idea that whole bunch actually masks you can sit on either side of this argument they were very much on the side that said um whole bunch masks the terroir mm -hmm. so they always they always like de-stem their cereal and then following up from the slingshot uh, and the mubas this we're back into the sort of smaller producer category here so for this wine um you can count the barrels that they produced of it easily yeah. i'm guessing by it was 580 cases, so that's about two, two, three hundred liter barrels. Yeah. Uh, so it's a small production. You know, it's um. You know. They, yeah, and they they make a lot of different wines. And Seth Coonan, who he sadly passed away like two years ago, um, his wife Megan uh, has taken over the running of everything. And um, he also had set up this other uh, project called the Valley Project, where mm -hmm. he would take in like young aspiring winemakers and this was like a warehouse full of young kids who wanted to make wine and literally making wine like a barrel at a time. So mm -hmm. it would be all about, okay, Zinfandel from this vineyard into that barrel, Sauvignon Blanc from this vineyard into this, whatever. And they, they have a, like, a, like a wine bar tasting room in Santa Barbara where it's just the Valley Project wines and they are mm -hmm. proper tiny quantities. Again, mm -hmm. it's all about showing the terroir of the different uh, regions, different ABAs. Mm -hmm. I see there's a hand raised. Um, Dennis, oh. you have a question for us? <laughs> well, Dennis. We just uh, need your mic. Paige, can you? <laughs> or you can type. Can it? It? <laughs> yeah, we're actually doing really he's, good for that. If he's too shy. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> Talking permitted. Oh, well, Dennis, we'll get back to you when you. Um, yeah, so I just noted somebody posted there that, okay, so the Kunin Sierra is 14%. Uh, yeah. Someone below just saying, I find this quite a bold wine. I would agree. It is it is quite forward and bold and like packed with flavor. But again, it's balanced, okay? So you can have balanced at 12.5% alcohol. You can have balanced at 14.5% alcohol. It's kind of judging the style and the winemaking to get it, to get it all right. 14% alcohol is fine if you've managed to keep acidity and have the fruit on the right side of the like yeah. red spectrum, not going too dark. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. For me, it's the lavender on this in this wine. That's uh, yeah. it's just really, really apparent how I don't know. If yeah. 
it, I don't get that many Syrahs with that sort of lavender hint. So I love that um, floral component in this one. You're, and you taste it. It's not just a smell. You actually yeah. taste lavender, which is kind of a, a, an interesting one. I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a thing that a lot of um, New World winemakers, particularly in California, making Syrah, saying they're, they're, they're passionate about the Northern Rhone. They're making a Northern Rhone style. But most of the time, they're kind of missing that sort of slight herbal character. Like mm -hmm. you said, like the lavender, the garig, the, those kind of like herbal herbal notes and sort of spice and pepper that come through. But I think couldn't do a really good job at getting that. And this is kind of like their entry level Syrah, if you want to call it entry level. So it's a blend of fruit from, I think, three vineyard sites. They then do a series of single vineyard bottlings of the Syrah. Yeah. Um, and some of those they, they hold back and release with a few more years age on them and they're really fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I see here just a, a question from Kenny asking, how do you manage the vine canopy in the warm areas of Cali to ensure good fruit at the harvest? Um, Alex, okay, yes, can me. you answer that? I mean, it, each region and each grower will have a different opinion on this, so it's a, it's a dangerous kind of question, but yeah. <laughs> Actually, what you do is, uh, so they're looking at the leaf area, we talk about leaf area, and, uh, and the amount of fruit you have. Uh, so as you're, we call it loading, uh, loading, the sugar loading of the fruit. So you want to make sure that the leaf area and the amount of fruit you have is in balance. And this gives you, um, you know, if you, if you have a very hot area, it's not uncommon to have quite a lot of fruit load so that it, the vine has quite a lot of fruit to charge up. Mm -hmm. like a bigger battery I suppose or a bigger sink yeah and this having more sinks means that you can have a slower ripening and keep it in control you can restrict the amount of vegetation the amount of leaves you have uh, there's a lot of viticulture you know the heights of your vineyard the spacings of your vineyard there's mm -hmm. absolute um, science on getting this right and, and everyone has a different opinion so it's really yeah. at, the jury's still out mm -hmm. um, but the classic way, like if you look even back in the, the olden days, if I want to put it that terms, the old bush vine, the goblet vine of Grenache in, in the south of France or in Spain, this has now been proven scientifically to be a super well-adapted training system for very hot climates because the vine can self-regulate a lot of these things itself. So, you know, we're, we're now, now because we use machines and we want lines, we have to kind of try and add some science to that, you know, the rows, but um, it wouldn't go too far to say that in really hot regions in Australia, people planting goblet is, uh, the only negative is that harvesting and pruning is, is painful. You have to get on your knees and it's really low. It's not as efficient and easy, but it's a great training system. So there's, um, but there's a lot of ways, um, mm -hmm. ways you, can, you can affect the canopy. Yeah, and there, there's, a, there's a growing movement away from the theory that um, sort of dropping fruit and reducing reducing yield gives you greater quality. There's a lot of people who will now tell you, you know, it's, it's let, completely not true. Less fruit does not give you better quality. You, no. you, let, you let the vine grow the amount of fruit that keeps it in balance, and then you use your canopy to keep the fruit shaded and to sort of keep it the way you want it to be. It's, I mean, a bit off topic, but it's a, it's a well-known kind of fact that the reason that the AOCs in France have, have brought in uh, tonnage per, for their appellations, tonnage limitations, is to control the volume of wine produced in an appellation. It, it's, uh, it's not for quality. Yeah. They're learning, I mean, people, they obviously tell you it is, but it's not. Uh, you can make fabulous, um, it depends on the grape, of course, and it changes in the region. So preface for that, but Sauvignon Blanc or Chardonnay for sparkling, uh, you don't need to worry as much about um, loading as or, uh, the tonnage on, in your hectares. In the UK, to give you a different perspective, we can't ripen much fruit per hectare. So we do drop fruit because we just can't, we don't have enough sun here to, to, to load them up. Yeah. So California, with, the, with that much sun, they can do, um, they can, there's, there's, there's a bit more freedom, I suppose, on that land. Yeah. No, it's interesting. Years ago, um, I did a thesis project on vigor and we were looking at four vigor groups um, kind of to test the hypothesis if the lowest yield results in the best wine. And it was always the middle two groups. Um, mm -hmm. So I mean, that, that is the balancing act, I guess. 
So, um, <laughs> yeah, I think from our side, oh, sorry, Alex, do you want to say something too? I was, I was just going to say, and it, the hard thing for anyone in, in the vineyard is that every year it changes and you can't predict yeah. the decisions. I was in the vineyard today, the decisions we're making today, we kind of have to cross our fingers and hope that the climate behaves and does what we want, but it won't. Yeah. So, you know, it's a roll of the dice. So some years you get it right, sometimes you don't. Yeah. So uh, one, one, one thing, just like on a slightly more kind of generic point, um, you know, we've, we, we've done this work to kind of like try to bring a selection of California wines to South Africa, the wines that we were really excited, we're really excited about in, in the UK. It took, it took us quite a while to really convince people yeah. um, that these are wines that they should be following and buying year after year and drinking, you know? So in the, in the first year, two years, you know, when we were going to sommeliers and saying, okay, I need you to delist your Pellini Monchet and list this Sonoma Coast Chardonnay instead. It was like, you know, no chance, you're crazy. You know, it's not gonna happen. Why would we sell California Chardonnay, da, 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 da. But, you know, it took some time. And after a few years, even the most kind of hardened sort of French and Italian sommeliers, they, they were delisting Burgundies um, and listing California wines in their place. Yeah. So it's it's something that, you know, like after seven years, we're still working on it. We're still like having to convince people sometimes, um, you know, some things like price, et cetera. You know, they always comes up, comes up in the conversations. But um, it's we, we've had like phenomenal success with the wines um, and it sort of continues to grow. Um, I would just, you know, tell people that, OK, if, if, it's their, if it's their first experience of California wines of this style, you know, like, you know, stick with it, you know, taste, taste the next vintage as well. And you'll see that they really are quality wines and they're um, hopefully at some point in the future, things like taxes and whatever will get smaller and the wines will maybe come down in price a bit. But yeah, um, de definitely worth sticking with. Um, and yeah, they're, they're, they're here to stay in the UK and um, hopefully South Africa too. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks so much. One final cheeky question. Um, in the UK, if you look at the New World, um, South African and California wines, uh, do people kind of look at New World wines and buy them on um, not really a price scale, but a stylistically? Um, is there a comparison between South African and American South wines in the UK consumer's mind, or are they quite separate things? Alex, were you going to say something there? I was going to say, uh, in, in London, my experience is I'm, I get uh, a lot of fabulous South African Shannon, um, but that's, that's, that's about it, I'm afraid to say. Like, the, the producers are here, and they present yeah. the wines, but when I go to bars, uh, that's typically mm -hmm. what I find from, uh, from South Africa. And it's actually usually quite interesting. You know, like, the cool kids of South Africa are in London, for sure. So you get yeah. good Shannon representation in London, and and it's always good fun, mm -hmm. but it is, I'd love to see some of, um, you know, the other little grapes that you're growing over there, over here. Mm -hmm. in, like, yeah. they're here, don't get me wrong, it's just when you go out, it's hard to find a, a bottle of something interesting yeah. to try it, I suppose, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think, um, you know, for a number of years in the UK, in London in particular, you know, there, there's some very good South African tastings that are put on every year, um, mm -hmm. really fantastic wines, much like California, sort of young, new, exciting winemakers trying to do things a little bit differently. But California really got ahead of um, South Africa and Australia in that they had a, they, they seem to have like a much stronger like marketing machine behind them. Mm -hmm. um, even just things like having like the generic California Wine Institute, like the generic board that's present in the UK, really yeah. all, year, all year promoting, promoting, promoting. And they're very careful to not not just promote big brands. They do put on specific events to promote that more kind of like boutique, esoteric, interesting side of California wine. What I think South Africa has been missing is that kind of generic body behind them that really supports that new young producer, you know? And, you know, I read things and hear things about how it's really difficult for 
exciting South African producers that are trying to do something a bit different. They can't get their wines mm -hmm. submitted and tasted and scored by critics because they're not typical, you know. And I think if they had a little bit, if they had a little bit more support from the generic, it's kind of like South, Af South African wine bodies, they would probably have a bit more success in London. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, yeah, so South African wine in London has like a has a, a nice following. Um, there's some great wines. Um, it just needs kind of a some, something bigger behind it to really push it. It's it's like uh, like Washington State and Oregon in the U.S. They're miles behind California, yeah. and that's and that's purely because California has a big marketing machine behind it. Okay. You know so. Yeah. Cool. Well, we'll take Next that on board again, South Africa. <laughs> Next yeah. tasting um, can be Oregon. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. exactly. We're quite sold on the American ones. So, um, yeah, just Alex and Keith, thanks so much for joining and um, spending your no summer problem. evening here with mm -hmm. us. Uh, we're freezing in South Africa. And for all the panelists, thank you so much. Um, just to recap, yeah, we're super excited about the new California wines, the new wave. Um, I think there is quite a parallel, I guess, in timing and style in South Africa, the South African Revolution and California. So, um, yeah, please check out the website for all the other offerings that we have, um, also from Riverson. And then have a look that the moment we are allowed to move wine again, we will launch a new Zoom series. Um, and then we can that. taste together again. Cool. Well, thanks so much. Wine again. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> We might have to ship internationally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how I'd go without being able to buy wine. That's, no. That'd be a first. So I'd no. be in that situation. So good luck with yeah. that. Cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> cool. Cheers, everyone. Okay. Wow. Thanks, guys. Bye.